Not Quite Hollywood, The Wild Untold Story of Ozploitation. Documentary film documents all these incredible genre movies that many people have not seen, many people have seen and love, directed by Mark Hartley, who's joining me here right now. Mark, thank you for joining me on WK It's a pleasure. As soon as um, you mentioned the word documentary, I think people switched off <laughs> all over the city. So we'll have to make it sound a little bit more exciting than that, I think. Okay, uh, an action-packed Movie? Roller coaster ride Roller coaster that is ride. A, a rockumentary. A rock, that's that's if I must say edited very similar to a music video. That is true. Yeah, yes. it's it's um, so one thing I actually noticed about this movie is that I don't know the the longest time you let someone talk is about <laughs> three sentences. Right? Really? Who who got three sentences? I know, right? It's I like, must have been asleep during that part of the editing process. Yes, but th- this movie is literally like it was crazy. Splash, kaboom. No, I never did that. Kabow, splam. Like, am I am I right? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, we had a limited time. We had a large number of films. I think we show scenes from 100 films in the documentary. We only had 100 minutes. So it wasn't... It also wasn't a documentary that was looking at, you know, uh, the Middle East crisis. It was about wild, crazy gonzo cinema, and it had to have that energy, or it wouldn't have been truthful to the films that it was, um, you know, celebrating. Sure, sure. Um, so let's let's um, start, I guess, where the movie starts. And um, so give me just very, very quickly uh, a, a brief, brief history of Australian cinema and then how the R rating changed that. Well, in a, more so than Australian cinema, um, Australian censorship was really strict um, in the, the late 60s. Uh, we were like the, I think, the second most heavily censored country in the world. How about that? Um, I think it, the most heavily censored was something like Northern Ireland, and we were just after that. So it was, people of my generation can't comprehend how incredibly strict it was, but I've heard that, you know, um, reproductions of the Statue of David were banned. And people could be arrested and thrown in jail literally for just holding a copy of Playboy magazine. That's how full on it was. And I'm not exaggerating. They're true stories. Wow. So um, in about 1971, uh, they introduced the R certificate, which meant finally there could be adult content on screen. Up until then, even art house films had had all the pubic hair snipped out of them. And suddenly, um, Australian audiences just went crazy for anything that had any kind of adult content in it because they'd been, you know, starved of it for so long. And uh, some very uh, smart filmmakers in Australia took full advantage of this and made a couple of cheap and cheerful nudie films, which just set the box office alive. It was a film called Alvin Purple, which um, cost $200,000 to make back then and grossed $5 million. Uh, I think one in every five Australian had seen it at some point, and it was an R-rated film, so it's quite, remac- remac- quite uh, miraculous. And um, it kind of took off from there. It was, as they say in the documentary, it was on for young and old after that. And we were uh, getting our industry back on track after it being in the wilderness for so long. People hadn't been making Australian films. And if there'd been any kind of Australian images on screen, the films had been directed by foreigners visiting Australia. So, um, you know, Australian audiences were starting to see Australian characters on screen, see Australian accents on screen. And because they were inventing the industry from the ground up, there were no rules. And I guess these um, Australian exploitation films took full advantage of that and just were all about getting the most crazy, insane images possible onto that drive-in screen. Hmm. Hmm. And now you uh, separate the movie into kind of chapters, I guess. We can call well, how, how would you call them? Yeah, well, they're, th- they're three categories, I categories, guess. Categories, yeah. okay. And and can you tell me uh, ab- about each one and then maybe some of the prime movies that really fit right into those? Well, it just seemed easier rather than having this big mesh of all these different kinds of films uh, over 100 minutes that we kind of um, split them because it seemed to me that the key personnel, the the Osploitation auteurs, let's call them, uh, really didn't stray that much from the different genres. So we have the, um, uh, in Australia, uh, we have an expression which is ochre, which is like an Australian redneck. Okay. So we had our ochre films and our sex films. And I think in the documentary that section's called Ockers, Knockers, Tubes and Pubes. (laughs) 
um, which is pretty self-explanatory when you see the documentary because it does celebrate a time when um, the Australian bush was up front and not out back. <laughs> and uh, there's lots of pubic hair on display. Actually, I can now uh, carbon date films from the amount of pubic hair featured on the women. So that's one skill I did develop making this film. And uh, there, uh, the second category is our horror and thrillers, and that's comatose killers and outback chillers. Comatose killers, because one of the key films of that genre was a film called Patrick about sure. a, a a guy in a coma with um, telekinetic powers. And the third section is just looks at our action films, and that's um, what is it? Kung Fu Masters and. Uh, I can't think. It's been so long since I watched the film. Um, Something anyway. that rhymes with masters. Yeah. So it has to do with exploding cars. Maybe car disasters. Well, something like that. Yeah. Pretty Gee, that's, sure. That's terrific. That's going to drive me nuts. I'm not going to be able to sleep. You know if, what? If anyone saw the film at a preview, please. It it it, it probably it probably has it right here, but that's actually, all right. It actually we'll doesn't. It but but it was something disasters, and kung fu masters. Anyway. But that, but that, you know, deals with all of those uh, chops, chop. How, how do you call them? Uh, chop socky. Chop socky. Chop socky. Well, we only really had one kung fu film made in Australia, which is The Man from Hong Kong. But right. it deals with that and uh, and uh, all our uh, white line fever crazy car movies. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Of which we, uh, you know, we excelled really. Yeah. Well, I mean, Mad Max is a classic. I mean, um, actually, there there were. There were not a lot of movies uh, featured that I, that I had seen. Of course, I, I had seen um, Mad Max, which you know brings me to to another question: um, Who do you think this documentary is more suited towards? The people who have seen the films, or the people who you want to see the films? Well, I always assumed that hardly anyone had seen the films. Um, so uh, we that was kind of one of the interesting things when we went to actually um, you know cut this film. It was very different to say making a documentary on American genre or English genre because you assume that most of the people who watch them are going to have some idea about the films that they're going to, that they're seeing on screen. But here, I said to the two other editors, like you know, no one is going to have a clue about most of these films, so we have to work out how much information we give about these films before we cut to the funny stories. And that was a pretty uh, hard juggling act, you know, information versus entertainment. Um, but it's also, I think, one of the um, the things that people appreciate the documentary. Uh, they they walk away uh, having discovered something. Um, there's not a lot of film documentaries that you can see that literally introduce films that you have absolutely no idea about. And this is one doc such documentary that you know you walk away and hopefully you've got a long list of films that you'd like to track down and see. And you've just been, um, uh, you know tempted with through um through some interesting you know excerpts and sound bites um uh a a a a film reviewer it's a sampler it's a sampler a film reviewer said um well one one said it's it's a almost almost a a feature length advertisement for 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 these type of films another film reviewer said it's more of a really good tv special than a great movie how would you respond to that? Do you feel like obviously those reviews paid, were kept from me? Did, did you did you feel that you you almost paid too much homage that these film to these films which you obviously love? I mean, granted, you have these critics, you know, keep on piping it and saying like, this is crap, you know. And then at the same time, you'll have the producers being like, oh, we had so much fun, it was so crazy. Um, do you feel like, uh, you know, perhaps your love um, was 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 too strong? For, for these not really I, I kind of think it's a pretty fair documentary I think it's a pretty irreverent documentary it certainly doesn't treat these films like they're all works of genius because <laughs> if it did I would be totally insane <laughs> and uh, I I think sometimes people obviously when, when you're making we, we make fun of a lot of the films people certainly if they hate the films I'll tell you they're very honest about the films that we're documenting but there is a great sense of fun about the making of these films oh, yes. and I think that maybe that's a little bit too infectious and people walk away thinking that all we're trying to do is talk about how great these films are but we're not we're just talking about how great the time was making these films and I think some people blur that a little bit sure. and I also think the fact that a lot of the clips you know, have been chosen for their entertainment value. Um, people walk away thinking, well, maybe we, uh, you know, maybe we've we've tried to make the films look too good. So I, I don't know. 
Um, I, I, I certainly, whenever people were disparaging about the films, I certainly stuck that in the documentary. Yeah. Um, and I, as a filmmaker, um, certainly don't love all these films. But, you know, I couldn't... Um, it wasn't my story. It was the filmmaker's story and the, the cast and crews of these films' story, and I'm just there to tell it. And if they want to tell funny, interesting stories and they had a blast and were really in, um, affectionate towards these films, well, that's what comes across in the documentary. Sure, sure. Um, you know, It's interesting about that TV comment, though, because mm. this film did actually start out. I had always planned it as a television series, hmm. and we could never raise the money to make it as a television series. Hmm. And when um, eventually we kind of got it funded as a feature, it all fell into place then because we could also then have the money to travel around the world, interview everyone we wanted to, and also remaster all the films within the documentary to, to look as good as possible, which we probably couldn't have done if it had ended up being a, a six-part television series. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd like to talk about that, you know, since you brought it up, how this movie did get off the ground. Um, now, I understand that Quentin Tarantino was involved. Is that correct? Well, inadvertently, I mean, we were lucky enough to get an interview with Quentin early on before we'd raised our finance, mm -hmm. and uh, it was having him involved and having a pretty good four-hour interview with him um, that helped us. I'm sure that's how we ultimately got the um, the money from our two international distributors from England and America, Magnolia and Optimum, that helped trigger the rest of the finance in Australia. I'm sure that Quentin, um, you know, proved to them that there was some... Uh, uh, international uh, in to, to uh, some kind. His, you know, he made it um, more ac accessible to to international audiences, and I'm sure that helped get it up. I'm look. I, I'm honestly, I think if we hadn't have got that interview with Quentin, then this film wouldn't have got made. Hmm. But he he certainly didn't phone up distributors for us, or you know, open up his wallet and hand me money and say just go and make the film or anything like that. But he was very generous with his time and uh, and putting his name to the project, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, one thing uh, I was telling a friend earlier about this film, and um, what, I, what I really like what you, what you did um, is that, uh, you know, there'll be a producer and it'll say blank, blank, producer, there'll be a director, it'll say blank, blank, director, and then Quentin Tarantino you just have labelled as fan. Yeah. So. Well, he, was, he wasn't a part of <laughs> the movement, the yeah. exploitation movement. He's there purely as a fan. Yes. And it was important to have someone who had seen these films outside of Australia to give an overseas perspective because um, in Australia, th most people didn't hear anything about the success of these films overseas. We heard about Picnic at Hanging Rock getting a standing ovation you know, on its New York release. What we weren't being told is that it was playing in one cinema in New York and our Kung Fu movie, The Man from Hong Kong, was playing down the road in 15. Mm. But Quentin was great because he spoke about these films from uh, an, uh, an American fan's point of view. And um, and also as a filmmaker who had been inspired by these films and had paid homage to them. Well, let's talk about that. Um, how did he pay homage to them? And also um, tell me about... Uh, when when he came uh, to show Australia Kill Bill and what happened there? Um, I had given up on the project. It was about five years into the project and we just couldn't raise the money. It was just no one was interested in funding us. Uh, so I gave up. And then a couple of months after that, I read an interview with Quentin where he spoke about how he had screened uh, the Australian film Road Games, which is featured in the documentary, to the cast and crew on the set of Kill Bill Volume 1. Hmm. And so I had amassed at that point a 100-page research document, and I just tracked down his assistant's email and sent it to him because I thought he'd be interested in reading it. It wasn't about luring him to the project because it was dead in the water at that point. And um, I got an email back the next day from his assistant that said, Quentin has read your document from cover to cover. What can he do to help you get the project up? Or something like that. So we went over and shot this interview with him. And um, as I've mentioned, we use that as a, as a calling card as a pitch document, and you know that eventually helped us get up. Um, and what was sorry? What was your other question? What what, what is the story? Oh, his, his homages. Well, certainly, um, if you in the documentary he talks about uh, referencing things like Patrick, the film we talked about, it, mm -hmm. the the guy in the comb with the telekinetic powers in Kill Bill, mm -hmm. and certainly anyone who's seen um, Death Proof will realise that there's a huge scene there lifted from a film called Fair Game, where a girl is strapped to the front of a car and driven through the outback. So yeah, he certainly wears his um, 
his influence is on his slave. Yes, yes. As a hood ornament, I mean, it's it's uh, ridiculous and entertaining and extreme and. <laughs> you just <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those things where you go, who on earth let them do that? Right. What 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 were they thinking? Um, you know. So you know, it begs the question. So you've directed uh, a lot of making ofs in the past, right? Smaller features, right? I'm not look. I uh, I had a music video background, and then when mm-hmm. I decided I'd work hard to get this project up, um, I felt I thought the easiest way I could do that was by earning a living doing it. Mm-hmm. So I. Um, put together a whole lot of DVD featurettes on on classic Australian films, but also on some of these exploitation films too. Mm-hmm. And I think that ultimately helped the documentary because I got to forge relationships with a lot of the producers and cast. So when we came to interview them for Knock White Hollywood, they kind of trusted me and were possibly a little bit more open with me than they would be with other people. Mm. Um, so that helped. So yeah, I had um, I had made a fair few uh, making ofs for for DVDs. Mm. But yeah, primarily my background was music video production. Right, as like I said before, you know, definitely comes out in this quick, fast editing and well, yeah, excitement like, of the film. I, I've never th- thought of myself as a documentary filmmaker, and I'm sure most documentary filmmakers who see the film will think of me in that way as well. And um, so it was, it was more about bringing um, some kind of my music video aesthetic to the project because I, I knew that it needed to be, you know, a pretty rock and roll journey. Yeah. Yeah. So why was this what you chose to do as your first film? I re- well, I didn't really choose it as my first film. I've had a lot of other projects that I've been trying to get up, but they just never happened. Mm-hmm. And um, this was the one that that managed to get up after a long time. So, um, you know, every everyone was working on various projects, and this is the one that happened. And you know, I just launched into it and did it as good as I could. And hopefully, um, you know, people see it and see some kind of, um, you know, craft there, and, you know, I get a chance to do something else. Now, you know, okay, in the, in this film, there's all these crazy behind-the-scenes production stories that come out. I mean, stories of stuntmen dying, stories of producers at the horse tracks betting the investment money in an attempt to get more money. Yeah. Um, you know, what what is perhaps your favorite craziest behind the scenes production story and maybe you can give us an even more detailed story that that is not in the in the movie something that's you know even an even juicier version my my favorite story in the film is the Dennis Hopper story which he amazingly tells us we uh, we got to interview Dennis and we had to remind him slightly of a lot of things that happened to him in Australia because right. uh, he wasn't he didn't have all his wits about him when he was uh in Australia in about 1976. Um, he made a film in Australia called Mad Dog Morgan, which is a, a Bush Ranger film. Um, you guys know what Bush Rangers are, don't you? I mean, if you can explain Outlaws, for our Outlaws, yeah. Sure. And uh, Western Outlaws. And uh, on rap, well, let's just say that, um, that Dennis was completely uh, drug and alcohol fueled through the entire film. And really didn't know what was going on and uh on rap he got onto a horse and drove across a creek bed to an awaiting car jumped in and sped off to mad dog morgan's grave the actual grave of the outlaw he was playing Hmm. he got incredibly even more drunk and tore up the cemetery decimated the cemetery then drove off again in with the police in hot pursuit they eventually pulled him over. Uh, he was still in his outlaw gear, which meant that he had guns and everything else attached to his costume. They gave him a breathalyzer test, and the amount of alcohol in his body, they pronounced him legally and clinically dead. <laughs> and he was put into, thrown into jail, and the next day he was taken before the judge, who said that he was never legally allowed to drive a car in the state of Victoria or never legally allowed ever again to be a passenger in a car in the state of Victoria. And he was um, driven to the airport, and that's how he left Australia at that time, which you know, is a pretty good way to go, I reckon. So that's that's one of my favourite stories. So they wrap the film, and that Thankfully happens. it happened on rap rather than on you know the yeah, first day. The, day the first day, though, he was, uh, as soon as he arrived, he went down to Sydney and got thrown in jail for um, getting into fistfights. The producers had to bail him out of jail you know, the second day of the shoot. So yeah, it was um, 
they wanted an outlaw and they got a genuine bona fide outlaw when they um they cast Dennis for that film. So a uh, little little bit of method acting there. The, produ- the production manager says he was 39 when he was making the film and no one ever thought that he would hit 40. Um, if you could, define for me the term grindhouse and what it means to this movie. Well, I'm not sure. Grindhouse, I guess, is an American expression that relates to the cinemas they were showing in. I assume I, I'm never really been part of that culture, so I don't understand. We um we didn't have grindhouses in Australia. We had um, drive-in screens and just regular cinemas, and these films crossed over. They um they they obviously there was a, a huge drive-in market in Australia because Australians loved their cars and we had good weather. So a lot of people were really interested in going to the drive-ins, and they were there was hundreds of them. Um, so a lot of these films made their money just travelling from drive-in to drive-in. And occasionally they'd play in the city hardtops, the, the regular cinemas. But they didn't play... We didn't sort of have our flea pit, flea pit sleazy 42nd Street cinemas, which I assume is what you guys refer to as Grindhouse. Mm-hmm. But I guess the films are, in a way, very similar to your Grindhouse films in the fact that they were down and dirty genre films. Mm. And... Um, these films were, you know, basically you know, the underbelly of the cultural um, films that we were sending out to the rest of the world, like Picnic at Hanging Rock and The Getting of Wisdom and My Brilliant Career, the films that people, um, you know, respected from Australia. These were their, you know... Walkabout. Yeah, Walkabout. These were these were the, uh, you know, the, 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 the uncle who turn up at Christmas and tell dirty jokes kinds right. of films, yeah. <laughs> Drunken with his shirt off or pants yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, Flushing the vicar. Right, right, as as they say, I guess. <laughs> um, so, okay, you know, definitely the, the drive-ins and, and, and where these movies were shown, you know, or or when they were imported to the grindhouse in America, you know, maybe this place where you weren't necessarily going to see a quality film, but maybe just to be in a dark place. Well, it's um, interesting, Tarantino says in the documentary, he saw a lot of these films in grindhouses in, in America, and he didn't know they were Australian films until the actors opened their mouths. Right. They weren't, I mean, these films were, whereas films like Picnic and Getting of Wisdom, Break a Morant, My Brilliant Career, Walkabout, were sold as Australian films, you know, because Australia was a new, uh, you know, uh, there was, it was a, the flavour of the, the month then in terms of in terms of art house cinema. These films were just sold as genre films, you know, that you were going to see a car chase film or a biker film or a, you know, a, a werewolf film or a vampire film, and they just happened to be, made in Australia. You didn't realise that until, you know, someone said g'day in them. <laughs> Throw a shimp on the barbie. Um, so, you know, let's... Uh, so what happens is, you know, you have, you know, all these drive-in theatres, right? You know, in America, you know, we had them very popular as well. Australia, you know, both car cultures, wide yeah. open spaces. Um, then home video comes along. Sure. And uh, kind of takes the wind out of the sails for these type of genre films. Um I mean, do you think that 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 there, that there still is, you know, exhibition for these? Are, are are films like this still being made? How have the the films changed, you know, based on how the exhibition has changed, and how do you see exhibition going in the future? Are you talking about in Australia or just in general? Um, in general. Uh, look, it's really difficult. People, you know, when pe- people have sixteen dollars to spend in going to see a film, and you know. You want bang for your buck, mm-hmm. and what are you going to do? You're going to go and see a low budget film that you know, you know, basically your price of the ticket is paying for the film, or are you going to go and see that $180 million film that's showing in the cinema next to it? That's the problem. Mm. Uh, you know, it's it's hard for these films to compete now in theatrical markets unless they're very, very smart and very, very good. And unfortunately, there's not a large percentage of them that are smart and good. And every so often, uh, films do come out that are breakthroughs, like Let the Right One In and like Splinter and like there's you know been some really great English films, like films like The Orphanage, you know that that just um, that reinvent the, the genre again. Um, you know, there are always going to be kids who want to see nasty things done to people. So there's always going to be some kind of audience for your Lionsgate, you know, um, let's get a toenail clippers and pull that fingernail off kind of movie. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's going to be harder for, for other smaller budget genre films, for sure. And, you know, maybe maybe their natural home is the Sci-Fi Channel or, you know, 
Netflix or VOD or whatever. Mm. I guess you have to be aware of that when you're making them. I've been to um, you know, markets and to the American film market and things like that, and you really, uh, it's an eye opener when you realise how much product is out there, and the people who are selling that product, it's not about the quality of it, it's about the quantity of it. It's about you know, well, we need to fill these holes, we need to, you know, we need so much, so many of these titles to you know, to fill up our 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 slots. It's not about what the quality is like of them. So. Mm. It's in, it's you know it's it's interesting. It's all about the one sheet now, isn't it? I guess I guess so. I guess so. Because when you're in that video library, you haven't heard of half of these films that are on the shelf, because they've just arrived, and it's whatever you see on that front cover. Right, right. Um, you know, so I guess uh, for my last question, you know, you um, you know got this this documentary out. Um, it, it's it's coming out tomorrow. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. And um, look, we like I said before, we had a similar problem in Australia. This film out, went out wide in Australia, went out mm-hmm. on about 50 screens, which is pretty wide for, it, for for an Australian film, let alone an Australian documentary. And we, when it screened last year, you know, in the same cinemas, it was up against Tropic Thunder, Batman, and um, and Iron Man, mm-hmm. and you know, you can't compete. Sure, sure. And um, you know, that's where you know we're lucky in Australia that we still have uh, a large art house circuit. And that's where films like this can find audiences and can make money because, you know, they just, they play forever. Um, so so I, I, guess, I guess my last question is, um, do you ever see yourself, you know, making a film like a, a Quentin Tarantino-esque film that, that maybe pays homage to these genre films that is gang bang, rock'em sock'em, breasts flashing all over the screen? Would that, would that be something you can see yourself doing in the future? Sure. Um, I'll leave my telephone number here if anyone's. <laughs> uh, look, I, I, I. The the thing that I liked about these films is that they were made for audiences. No matter what you think about them, they were there. They were made by people who loved films, and they were there to be um, watched by the widest possible audience. And they were, they were always the kind of films that I wanted to make. They're the kind of films that I loved when I was a kid, and they're the kind of films that I still love. And you know. Making films shouldn't be it. It should be a, a gigantic communal experience. It should be about finding, getting your film to as many people as possible. And uh, and sure, that's very much what I'd like to do. Make you know films that find audiences that people w- walk away and have enjoyed them and had some fun. And hopefully, you know, in a very small documentary style way, that's what this film does. Well. I, I definitely found it a lot of fun and, uh, you know, very eye-opening. And I know that I'm going to be going on Netflix and watching a lot of these movies that I haven't seen before. Um, the movie is not quite Hollywood. It tells the story of the Ozploitation films. Director Mark Hartley, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much.